Well, this morning, as you know, is the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ so many years ago. On Friday, we went over the whole scenario, taking it from the book of Mark, Mark's retelling, which is essentially Mark writing it down as Peter recounts it to him about what happened those two nights before and what happened after when Jesus was resurrected. So on Friday, we talked about the scenario beginning in Mark 14, where there was a plot to kill Jesus. He was teaching way too many radical things, and he was rubbing all the religious rulers the wrong way. Isn't it amazing? Jesus rubbed the religious rulers the wrong way. And it's sometimes that way today, because the truth about what the Scripture teaches and about who Jesus is very often comes in conflict with our traditions. Um, hopefully it won't happen here today. We saw that there was an anointing. A woman named Mary came and, and anointed him, and he said, she's doing this before my burial. And so Mary, who was always at the feet of Jesus, wherever it is you see her mention in the Scriptures, she's always at the feet of Jesus, serving, listening. And she got it when all the disciples didn't, that Jesus was going to Jerusalem. He was going to be crucified and die. And so she comes in and anoints him with this expensive oil. And Judas Iscariot, seeing this, came, became incensed. Why was this expensive perfume poured out on Jesus? It's the very picture of worship. Why was Jesus given all this attention? You know, I, I could have, you know, sold that for some cash and pocketed it. And that really was his deal. And so at this point, he became so upset, he left. And he went to the religious rulers and he says, what do you, you know, what will you give me to betray him? And it's because he wanted the money. And there are a lot of people motivated, even in religious circles, uh, for money, as opposed to doing what God would have them do and do the right thing. And here, he's one of the 12 that was chosen. It's actually interesting. Judas was one of the only ones that was not from the Galilee area. It's the only one. So it's kind of interesting. And then we see Jesus sit down for the Last Supper, which is basically the Old Testament Passover, celebrating it with them, drinking the cup with them. And he's saying... From now on, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do it in remembrance of me. Instead of the exodus that occurred in, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, every time you do this, the bread is my body, the cup is my blood. And suddenly, the Old Testament pictures took on a New Testament picture of Jesus Christ. And so he shares this with his disciples, and they promptly leave from there, and they well, I'm sorry, before they leave, there's a whole accusation that somebody's going to betray him. He says, one of you will betray me tonight. And they all argue about who it is. It's not me. Oh, is it me? You know, and, um, and then Peter said, it doesn't matter if everybody leaves you, Lord, I'll never leave you. I'm, you know, I'm your man. And Jesus said, uh, by the time the cock crows three times, you will have denied me twice. And that kind of shuts everything down. And everybody believes he's the betrayer. We know that Judas dips into the cup with him. And, he's, and he looks at Judas and he says, do what you must do quickly, Jesus says to him. And he promptly leaves and he goes to let the, the religious rulers know that where Jesus will be. So Jesus is then with a hymn, goes down the Kidron Valley, goes over this little stream that's laced with blood at this time because they have sacrifices happening in the temple, a reminder of where Jesus was headed. And he goes up into this area called the, Ganesh, the, the wine press or the, or the olive press into the Garden of Gethsemane. <coughs> it's a pressing, and Jesus is being pressed in this olive grove. And with his disciples, he takes three of them a little closer, and then he leaves them a little behind, and he prays, and he prays three times, Lord, if this cup could pass from me, but not my will, but thy will be done, giving us an example of what it is when we're told to do things by God that are difficult, and we don't want to, and yet the Lord calls us to do it. Jesus is our best example of being obedient. And he comes to the disciples who he asked to stay awake and pray with him just for a little while, and they were all asleep. And he does it three times, because anytime Peter's involved, there's three times. Everything's threes with Peter. He tells him, couldn't you stay awake for me one hour? And he says, truly, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
So that's where that passage comes from. And then, of course, the third time he wakes them up, he says, get up, my betrayer's here. And Judas comes with a long parade of soldiers. And they go to lay hold of Jesus. Peter, thinking he would rescue all of them, pulls out his sword and he starts hacking at a giant band of trained soldiers. Not his smartest move. And Jesus stops him after he cuts up the ear of one of the high priest's servants and he says, listen, Peter, if you're going to live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. And he picks the ear up. I imagine he <laughs> blew it off and, and he heals him. And we're given his name. His name's Malchus. And he'll never forget that day when he lost his ear and then Jesus healed him right there. And well, that should have been a hint to these guys, but they took him anyway. They took him to be tried this is between two and four in the morning. And they move on and there's somebody following them. They realize that there's a young man who's covered in a sheet, freshly awakened. He likes to get cozy at night, so he didn't have any clothes on. So the Romans see him following and they turn around, grab his sheet, and he just leaves the sheet and he runs. And so he's the first streaker. And he doesn't get caught. And we know the history tells us this is John Mark, the author of this gospel. And that's why it's only found in this recording of the gospel of Mark. Then he's taken and he's given to Annas and Caiaphas. And they go back and forth and they question him about his followers. And by the way, to have a court proceeding between two and four in the morning is illegal. To not have witnesses there is illegal. All of what they're doing is they're trying to make it seem like they're doing the right thing, but they want Jesus dead. And they want to do it before their sacred Passover. It's interesting. Murder seems to be okay before you have a big meal, but not during the big meal, which is so hypocritical. And we know this day is Black Friday, where Jesus was taken. After this, he's taken... And he's led away and delivered to Pilate. Pilate being the, the governor of that area in Jerusalem. They take him there in the morning and it's early. And he questions Jesus and the high priests question him and they accuse him of all these things and he says nothing. And Pilate says, don't you hear all the things they're saying about you? Don't you have anything to say in your defense? And he says nothing. And we're reminded of Isaiah 53 where Jesus would be the Messiah, the one who would come, the Redeemer, would be like a lamb led to a slaughter, like a sheep before her shears, and say nothing. Jesus didn't defend himself. And it caught Pilate by surprise, and he's, he marveled at this, because he's seen lots of guilty people be accused, but none like this one. And multiple times he tries to get Jesus out of it. He tries to give him away and let him go. But the crowd who's gathered around his palace screams out and yells for his blood. So he's trying to figure out a way to get rid of Jesus. He brings another criminal out named Barabbas. And he says, listen, it's this time of the year, the Passover, when you guys have the scapegoat, we kind of emulate that and mirror that. And so I will let go one of these of, of the Jews, which one do you want? We got Barabbas who's guilty of murder and we've got Jesus who I can't find a darn thing wrong with. Which one would you like us to release? And they all cry out, Barabbas, Barabbas, give us Barabbas, give us the murderer. He tries and tries and he, sa he says, well, what am I gonna do with the king of the Jews? And they say, crucify him. His blood will be on us and our children, they shout out. And so reluctantly, Pilate lets a murderer go and washes his hands in front of everyone. He says, listen, I don't want anything to do with this. You guys do whatever you want. Giving consent basically to his death and not willing to take responsibility. Boy, so many people are like that, aren't they? So after Barabbas, there's the crowd shouting out, crucify him, crucify him. And he eventually gives in and offers him up to be whipped first. He figures if I beat him up enough, maybe the crowd will stop cheering for his blood, and yet it doesn't happen. And they, what they do is they assign him the crossbeam to carry, and they put it on his freshly whipped back. 
a whipping that very often would tear all the skin off of the back to expose your ribs and internal organs sometimes fall out because of this whipping. So after Jesus was beaten, blindfolded, beaten, and they mocked him and pressed a crown of thorns upon his head, they put a purple robe on him and they all bowed down mockingly and then they tore the purple robe off once it had been there long enough to coagulate some blood and put his own clothes back on him and they sent him to, the, to be crucified. On the way, Jesus' strength was failing and so they took somebody from the crowd, Simon the Cyrene. Cyrene's in Africa. So they grabbed a convenient African and threw him underneath the cross and made him carry with Jesus alongside, being the very picture of us. They bring him to a place called Golgotha, which is the place of the skull. And Jesus was taken to this place which used to be called Mount Moriah. Just like it says in tw chapter 22 of Genesis when Abraham took his only begotten son up on top to sacrifice him, the Lord provided a lamb. And God provides his only son this day as a lamb and a sacrifice for our sins. So the Romans were there and as this whole thing was happening, and of course everybody likes to see a crucifixion or a hanging uh, if it's more contemporary. They're all gathered there and people are crying and people are cheering and people are mocking. The soldiers are busy dividing up what possessions were on Jesus because they stripped him naked. All of the wonderful paintings that you've seen of Jesus on the cross are not accurate. He was naked. People are just trying to play nice and, you know, dress it up for the kids so you can go through the museum and view it. But he was stripped down naked, and that's part of the crucifixion. You were hung by your hands and by your feet to the place where you begin to drown. Your lungs begin to fill with fluid, and you really drown. It's not the blood necessarily. And people hang there for three days at a time. So this is not a quick death, but Jesus's was relatively quick. It was six hours, and he was hanging on the cross in misery. <coughs> We're introduced to the thieves, one on each side of Jesus, who are mocking him in the beginning. <coughs> and then as time goes by, one of the thieves during this six-hour period begins to soften in his heart. And he says, hey, we, we, we deserve what we're getting here on the cross. But this man's innocent. And so he tries to stop his buddy from doing it, from mocking Jesus. And in a point of faith, the man says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Which means that man just showed faith in who Jesus was and what he was doing, which is how anybody gets saved. Before he went to a Bible study, he was baptized. Before anything ever happened, he showed faith in Jesus, and Jesus responded by saying, today I tell you truly, you will be with me in paradise. This guy was saved because he confessed Jesus Christ as Lord, showing us that it's not about what you do, it's about who you know. And Jesus finally dies. Set the third, thank you. Set the third, set three o'clock. It's actually called the ninth hour. Jesus calls out. He says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is, my God, my God, why are you so far from hearing me? And the people thought he was calling on Elijah, which shows you how badly they understood the language except Jesus was pointing us to Psalm 22, which was written long before Jesus came, about how the Messiah would come and he would be crucified and bleed and die, and about how his bones would be all out of joint. And I imagine before Jesus came and died, no one knew what that meant until you understand crucifixion, which wasn't even invented by the Romans. It was perfected by the Romans, to the point where they would have thousands of bodies along the main route that goes into Rome. Uh, if, you ever saw, um, if you ever saw some of the old movies, they portray that. And so crucifixion was something perfected by the Romans, but it wasn't invented by them. And all of his bones hanging out of joint. And we see these witnesses. We see that the, 
veil inside the temple was torn from top to bottom without anybody tearing it other than God's hands, I imagine. This veil, which took a team of horses to be able to lift into place, it wasn't your average piece of drapery. And it was a witness that the way to be able to go into God's presence now was no longer separated by a figurative veil, but Jesus' body breaking was the access that we have before God because he died for us. We see another witness in the women that they were there and they watched Jesus die. All of his disciples but one, who was John and he was a teenager, not a real threat to the Romans who were guarding him. And all of his friends left him. He was left utterly alone, except for the women who stayed there because they weren't a threat to the Romans. And we have one soldier who, when he sees Jesus, and he sees Jesus praying from the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. When he sees the graciousness of Jesus, when he sees everything that's transpiring, there's an earthquake. All of this happens, and he goes, surely this man was the son of God. Even his enemies are confessing that Jesus is who he said he was. So after all of that, we see an undercover brother comes out from being undercover, Joseph of Arimathea, who's on the council. He's one of the seven. He's one of those who are on the Supreme Council, the religious rulers who persecuted him. He was not um, part of what they were doing. And another one, we recognize Nicodemus. These two very rich men come and claim the body of Jesus from Pilate and take it. And Joseph of Arimathea puts it in his own tomb, a tomb that was hewn out of solid rock by hand so that his family might have a burial place. And Jesus is the first one, and he gives it to Jesus. Of course, he wasn't going to use it for more than a weekend. So he takes clean linen, the rich man would do this, and wraps his body. They wrap the body very traditionally in a mummy sort of fashion, and then the head gets wrapped in something different and folded over, and there are spices that they bring, but it's just the beginning because Passover is about to begin. The Holy Sabbath is about to begin, and as the sun goes down, they become disqualified from being able to participate and they become lawbreakers if they don't get under cover by nightfall. And so they're hurrying to get him in the grave and they take a large stone and it's rolled in front. So we see that the high priest and the, and the chief priest go to Pilate and they say, listen, this man said he was gonna rise in three days. So if you don't get there and seal this thing up and make sure it's solid and his his uh, followers don't come and steal his body, you're going to have a martyr on your hands. And so he says, we'll take a contingent of soldiers and make it as secure as you can. And so there are 16 soldiers guarding this tomb, sealing it up with rope and wax. Anybody to break that seal and to be found would be killed. Anybody who would break that seal and not caught, they would go and they would kill all the members of their family and their town. Breaking the law in Rome was a big deal. It's not like shoplifting. <laughs> they don't even do anything in here. So Jesus is in the tomb, and there's this period of time that now passes where everybody is celebrating the Passover and not being able to forget all of the events that just occurred. Not understanding that these sacrificial lambs that are being sacrificed don't cover over sin. They're a picture of the one who ultimately would come, who would be Jesus. So we pick up the narrative with the women in Mark 16. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. The job hadn't been finished. And very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door for the tomb for us? When they looked up, they saw the stone had already been rolled away, and it was very large. The stone was about two and a half tons. You've got three women who, in the middle of going to spend time at Jesus' tomb and to finish what had been started, on the way, remember, oh my goodness, how are we going to move that stone? And it says they talked about it the whole time. 
well, what are we going to do? We got all this stuff. We're going to carry it all back. I mean, they're on their way to the tomb. They don't know about the soldiers. They have no idea. And they also don't know about an angel who showed up, who moved the stone, not to let Jesus out, but to let us look in and realize he wasn't there. And the soldiers shook and they fell like dead men. They passed out when this happened. Mark doesn't give us that account, but Matthew does because Matthew's tight with all of those religious officials and he gets the story from them. And so they go and they go, well, who's going to move the stone? It's kind of like getting halfway to work and saying, oh, I forgot my phone. So they're having a conversation on the way, but they get there and they find the stone rolled away. They don't understand necessarily what's going on. It says in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17, I love them that love me and those who seek me early shall find me. It's interesting that women are the first witnesses of the resurrection. And they are because they're the first ones up. They're the first ones out. And Jesus picked them especially to be the first witnesses because they were up. It's a good thing to get up early. It's a better thing to shut the TV off and wake up early. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in long white robes sitting at the right side. By the way, we find out from the other gospels, it's an angel, but he looks like a young man, which tells me there's hope for us. When we go to heaven, we won't be as old as we are. And they were alarmed. I bet they were. Looking at the tombs, bad enough. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. If there's any doubt as to whether he really died or not, there it is. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell his disciples and Peter. You know what that tells me? Peter's not really considered a disciple anymore. Because he turned his back on Jesus. Remember, he denied him three times. Tell the disciples, who apparently are all gathered together, and Peter. Can you imagine being Peter? Jesus is looking for you, man. <laughs> that would scare me. Go and tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him as he said to you. Because they didn't listen a lot. They had to be reminded. So they went out and quickly and fled from, the, fled from the tomb and they trembled and were amazed and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. They got this golden shining guy sitting in the place where a dead body was giving them news that Jesus has risen, which is bizarre. And they were freaked out. So they dropped their packages and ran back. We're given the rest of the story. They run back and tell the disciples. The disciples don't believe them. So what happens is John and Peter go ripping out of there, running to the tomb. Peter's a large man like myself who doesn't do any aerobics. John is fleet of foot, and he is younger. So John gets there first, but he won't go in because he suspects something has happened. Peter, because he didn't give a rip about anybody or anything, jumps right inside this tomb and starts looking around. Peter assumes the Romans took his body because he's always got a conspiracy up his sleeve. You know these people. But John suspected a miracle. We find that in John's gospel. He tells us, but John thought something else that Peter did. And so the women are now coming back and they're not talking to anybody because who in, the, who in the world do you tell this wild, crazy story to? And when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. And she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe it's an amazing thing. These women come back. They tell their story. They send John and Peter out to check, and presumably Mary Magdalene's with them, and then they go back to the other disciples, and Mary lingers and weeps at the tomb, and Jesus shows up. And he says, woman, why are you weeping? And she, presuming he was the gardener, looked at him with tears in her eyes, not recognizing him, 
probably because of the tears and the puffiness and all, and saying, if you have taken his body and laid it somewhere, please tell me and I'll take it. You're going to take a bloody mess of a human being, dead corpse, really, by yourself, Mary Magdalene? I mean, unless she was some big woman, which I don't think so. It's ridiculous. And then he says to her, Mary. And with that word, Mary, and that tone, she recognizes it's Jesus. And she grabs hold of him and doesn't want to let go. And Jesus says, you got to let me go. I haven't ascended to my father yet. You can't hold on to me. I got places to go, people to see, things to do. And so Mary Magdalene, we're told that she had seven evil spirits. It's interesting because from this point on, from chapter 9 on, there, you may have a little footnote in your Bible that the oldest manuscripts do not contain from verse 9 to the end of the chapter. But you might be amazed to find out that early church fathers as early as 150 uh, AD are recording these events from the book of Matthew. It's not, in the, it's not in the most reliable transcript, which is the one that has all the pieces in it, but it is from earlier. And there are no less than two dozen earlier um, references to this passage. So although it is different, and it, it seems to have a different meter and thing, he, what he's doing is he's condensing all these things. It's not a timeline story. For you students who may look this up and say, What's that little letter mean next to chapter 8, uh, next to verse 8? So there it is. Mary Magdalene, we find out, has had seven demons cast out of her. And of course, everyone thinks that she was a woman of ill repute, although we're not really told that explicitly. But you just wonder if you had seven demons, what would you live like? And you pretty much fill in the blank there. So they're going back, and the whole idea of chapter nine, of verse 9 on is to say they didn't believe. You're going to notice this common statement as we go through. They didn't believe. The women came back. They didn't believe. Mayor Magdalene says, I've seen him. They don't believe. They got a real faith problem here. And after that, he appeared to another, and from another form, and two of them that walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. If you remember... There were two disciples on the road leaving Jerusalem. This is three days after everything had happened. And they're on this road to Emmaus. And as they're walking, somebody's coming up behind them. You know, when you're walking on a sidewalk and somebody walks a little faster than you, you know, you kind of want to move over, let them pass on the left. Unless you're from England and you let them pass on the right. <laughs> and this mysterious figure, probably with a hoodie up, said, Hey, so uh, what are you talking about as you guys are walking along and looking sad? That's actually what it says. And they said, ah, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. We thought that he was a great, he was a great prophet and he did great deeds and healed people and everything. We thought he would be the Messiah, the one that would come, but the Romans grabbed him and hung him on a cross and he died. So it couldn't be the Messiah. And Jesus said, how slow to heart you are to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And it says, beginning with Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, he reasoned with them about how the Messiah would have to suffer and die before his glorification. And they had a Bible study along the road until it got dark. And they paired off like they were going to go somewhere else because they were arriving where they were supposed to be. And Jesus continued on forward as though he were going on further. And they said, well, listen, it's dark out. You know, it's not a good idea for you to be out here. Streetlights haven't been invented yet. So you really should come in with us. We'd love to have you for a meal. So they have him in the darkly lit room and they put him in a place of prominence because he's a guest and they ask him to pray the Shema probably and he goes to break the bread and as he breaks the bread, it says their eyes were opened and they realized it was Jesus. And as soon as they recognized him, he disappeared. <laughs> bread fell to the plate. Listen, Irish people got nothing on Jesus's exit, okay? <laughs> And in the middle of the night, they said, well, didn't our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us on the way? Let's go back and tell the disciples. And so they bolt. Now, remember, this is a 12-mile 12 12 mile walk. They just walked out of Jerusalem, and they wanted Jesus to come in because it was dark. And they split. They didn't care. No flashlights. 
out the door they went and they went to go tell the disciples. And when they get there and tell the disciples, the disciples say, we don't believe you. They don't believe the women. They don't believe Mary Magdalene. They don't believe the disciples. Later, he appeared to the 11 as he sat at a table and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. Well, I imagine he would. Because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. How many of you have a relationship and you're absolutely sure you have a relationship with Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God? Let me see your hands. You see these people? You better believe these people. This is truth. You remember, he shows up, and it's Sunday morning, by the way. That's part of why we gather on a Sunday. Jesus shows up every Sunday. First day of the week, he shows up. The disciples are all gathered. Doors are locked. Windows, they, they think they're going to, you know, they're next. And Jesus said, peace be with you. He just shows up with every window and door locked, and they're hiding out in their hideout. Jesus shows up and says, peace be with you. And he says, listen, I'm not a ghost, because he knew what their thoughts were. It's a ghost. He says, a ghost does not have flesh and bone, as you see I have. He didn't say flesh and blood. It's interesting. And then he said, you have something to eat? <laughs> All of Jesus' post-appearances after his resurrection, he's eating. There's hope for me. He sits with what's known as the 11 now, but they used to be known as the 12, which is kind of like a biker gang name. But not all 11 of them were there. There was one who was missing, who was Thomas. Thomas is out getting food probably for everybody up at McDonald's or something. And he comes back in, and now all the disciples are saying, we've seen him. He's risen. It's true. The women have told us. People on the road to Emmaus told us. Mary Magdalene told us, but now we believe because we saw him with our own eyes. And Thomas says, I will not believe unless I can thrust my hand into the hole in his side and stick my finger into the hole in his hand. I am not going to believe. That's a strong statement of unbelief. One week later, Sunday morning, Jesus shows up and says, peace be with you. And Thomas is there. And this is why he gets the infamous name, Doubting Thomas. He was not a Doubting Thomas. He was an unbelieving Thomas. He says, I will not believe. He was an unbeliever. And Jesus said, come, put your fingers in the hole in my hand. Thrust your arm into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas drops to his knees and he says, my Lord and my God. And he doesn't say it like, Oh, and gee, he's saying, <laughs> my Lord and my God. He called him Elohim, which is the ancient sacred name for God, which is a plural, by the way. Actually, it's not even a plural of two. It's a plural of three. Anyway, I get off track. If you're a guest, <laughs> this is what I do. And Jesus rebukes them because they did not believe. And he said to them, Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Gospel means good news. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, you have to know Mark is condensing this into a very tight form. If you go to Matthew, you'll see a little bit more of an extended form of what Jesus was talking about. It's not just believing and being baptized. It's actually just belief. We found that out from the man who was on the cross. If you want the longer one, you can go to Matthew 28, verse 19 and following, 18 and follow. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples. Jesus said this when he was in Galilee, not when he was with the, the 12. So this is a second time Jesus is saying it. It's not the same statement. It's a different statement in another place. It's a more elaborated on because Matthew's uh, good enough to do that for us. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, make disciples. Disciples are different than converts. Disciples are disciplined followers. 
of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So Jesus, once he rebukes his disciples for not believing, he tells them to go and tell everybody else who probably won't believe. It's rather interesting. And then a nice controversial passage. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And they will drink anything deadly. It will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. If you wonder why it is you don't go around doing all these things, if you read the scriptures, you'll see that it was done. And it was a confirmation of Jesus' ministry in the early church. I don't know how many of you are in the business of healing, but can God still heal? Yes. Absolutely. It was much more necessary for Jesus, and it was much more necessary to establish the church. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Speaking in tongues. We see this in the second chapter of Acts when the Spirit of God comes at Pentecost on the church. And they all speak with other tongues, actually other known languages. And we know that because there's a list of all these other known people who are in the town who happen to be walking by where the 120 disciples are being kept. And they are speaking in unknown languages to them. And yet everyone who, who runs by their place hears them declaring the glories of God in their own language. Now, is that the gift of tongues or is that the gift of interpretation? Because if, if there's 120 of them all speaking different languages and I hear them all speaking in my language, maybe I don't have a right perspective on what this means. But it said that they had these little tongues of fire that were up over their heads. Forgive the artist, he's doing his best. This sort of aura on each one of them because the Spirit of God was falling for the very first time here at Pentecost. They spoke in tongues, and then after Peter preaching, they baptized a bunch of them, and the church was born, the very first New Testament body. Handling snakes? I don't think so. But if you look in the book of Acts, if you go probably chapter 26 in the book of Acts, where Paul is actually gathering up some firewood, they just crashed the boat. He said, listen, you better pull over. You're going to crash the boat and kill everybody. And the boat ends up crashing. And he goes, I told you. Paul's on his way to prison, actually and he's doing them all a favor. All of the prisoners are gathered on the shore, and he gathers some wood to make a fire to get everybody warm because they're dripping wet. And he reaches into a stack of wood, and a viper, a poisonous viper, comes out and bites Paul to the point where it's hanging on his arm. And he just shakes it off. And the people of the area said, oh, he's going to die. Let's watch. And they stood and they watched him because one of the first signs is you begin to swell up everywhere. And then eventually your throat swallows. You can't swallow, you can't breathe, and you fall over dead. So these guys are like, good, we got entertainment this evening. <laughs> so they're watching and nothing happens to him. And first they said, oh, well, God's mad at you. That's why you guys crashed. The, you know, and he's, he's against you. And you know, that's why he's trying to kill you. And then they said, this guy's a god. They went right from, you know, God hates you to your God. <laughs> people can be very fickle. And so there are people who did get bit by snakes and nothing happened to them. It's recorded in the scriptures for us. And laying hands on the sick and them recovering. Absolutely. It happened all throughout the beginning of the, the establishment of the church and God is still the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Now, this other one I wouldn't recommend drinking poison and not being harmed. Remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil, he put him up on a high place in the temple and he said, listen, jump down from here because the scripture says that the angels will come and rescue you. You can trust God to the point where you just throw yourself off this high place. And Jesus said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So don't tempt the Lord God by doing stupid things because you may end up reaping what you sow. But basically what he was saying was, you don't have to worry wherever you go and whatever it is you're doing, I'll be with you. 
and it doesn't matter if there's snakes, if there's poison, if there's whatever. People trying to kill you, don't worry about it. Don't look over your shoulder. Don't walk around in fear. I'll be with you. That, that's basically what he's saying, right? Okay. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and they preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs, amen. Through the signs that he just listed, that's what followed the disciples as they went. And so that's where the book of Mark actually is concluded with these last verses, even from verse nine on, uh, where it's in controversy. But you can see, it does not say anything other than what we find in the other gospels either. In 1 Corinthians 15, speaking of the resurrection, Paul writing to the Corinthians saying, for I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's why Jesus came. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. That's to prove that he was innocent. And that he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter's original name, and by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, the time Paul was writing. But some have fallen asleep, which is a Christian word for dying. After that, he was seen by James and then by all the apostles. So it's interesting how we're given... Paul's recommendation that all of this is true. And there was a point at which over 500 people at once saw Jesus risen from the dead. This is the most detailed chronological history keeping of any event ever. More than, you guys heard of Plato? Idiot. No, just kidding. Plato, do you realize that... Everything written about Plato, Plato was written hundreds of years after his death. And you read this in school as though this were verbatim exactly what happened. And Caesar, everything that we have about Julius Caesar, we only have one copy. And yet the scriptures, we have over 400,000 copies. And there are people that are still arguing and shooting themselves over stupid little grammatical issues. It is the most chronicled thing that ever happened in history is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Can it be believed? Well, if you can believe anything, and my goodness, if it's on the internet, you should believe it, right? <laughs> if you can believe anything, you can believe this. It's not faith without reason. It's a reasonable faith. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels because he became man for us, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. By the way, he didn't just taste death. He swallowed it whole. He put it down. The whole purpose of why Jesus came was because we are sinners from the smallest to the biggest of us. And no one of us is going to be able to go before God at the end of our life and have any right to enter into heaven on our own merit. And so Jesus came and died in our place and took the punishment for our sin as long as we put our faith in him. And that's it. And then he does a work called being born again. And he comes into your heart and your mind and he makes you a new creation in Christ Jesus and all things become new. That's why we gather on a Sunday. That's why we praise the name of Jesus. That's why our lives are changed and different. And that's why we have hope. Because Jesus died, was buried, and was risen again to prove who he was and to free us from the power of sin so that it doesn't reign in our bodies anymore. It doesn't tell us what to do. It doesn't boss us around and lead us by the nose. And we're free from the punishment of sin because Jesus took it. Anything that happens in your life, God is not punishing you. He's training you because he already punished his son. Amen. In Galatians 2.20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God 
who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the Christian life in a, in a spoon. That's the smallest concentration I could think of. Jesus died for me. And it's not I who live. I don't just do what I want to do and go where I want to go and say what I want to say. And My goodness, I'd be a different person and I shouldn't, leave, I shouldn't be standing up here if that were the case. But my life has been given to him because he gave his life for me. I hope that's the case for every one of you. Here's my voice. And so that is what the resurrection is about. This pagan name that's been attached to the resurrection, Easter, comes from an ancient god, Eshtar. And we chase eggs and embrace bunnies and eat chocolate until we're sick. <laughs> There's always a substitute for the real thing. Whether it be Christmas, they take Christ out of it, it's just Xmas. And instead of Christ, the birth of Christ, you've got Santa Claus and toys and snow, Charlie Brown Christmas. There's always a substitute for the real thing of what God offers. I would just challenge you to look through all of that back in time to what Jesus did as a gift for you personally, every one of you, that if you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that he will forgive you of your sins and make you a new creature in, creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. 